Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Creating Interdisciplinary Elementary Service Learning Units. This is our recorded version of the webinar, so there will be a few times throughout the presentation where I'll ask you to just pause and respond to the prompts that are on the screen, since we can't do that in a live fashion. So just so you know who's on the call with you today, my name is Whitney McKinley and I'm the Professional Development Manager Diversity Lead here at NYLC. So for the webinar today, we have just a few goals. By the end of today's webinar, you should be able to identify standards-based desired results, create a unifying big idea and supporting essential questions, and understand how to plan your formative and summative assessments across the disciplines. So just going into this, as I mentioned, we have a couple of slides that you can just kind of reflect on independently. Uh, the first one is really to understand what your current unit planning style is. So just take a quick moment and check in to see if right now, when you are looking to develop service learning units, you currently use the IPART cycle, backward design, or some other format. The format that we use here at NYLC is really grounded in the backward design process. So just as an overview, you should check in with your familiarity with backward design. We have a few options on the screen here of novice, intermediate, or advanced. I would say that most likely this webinar is catered to intermediate or advanced users of backward design just so you have some background knowledge. However, if you are a novice, that's perfectly fine. It will get, definitely give you an overview of the process. Okay, so speaking of an overview of the process, to start off today, I'm going to give you just a brief overview of what the unit planning process looks like. The process is made up of four stages that align with the backward design format. In the first stage, you will identify your desired results or what you want students to know, do, and understand by the end of the unit. In stage two, you're going to determine what evidence students must demonstrate to show mastery of the concepts. In this stage, you'll want to plan both your formative and your summative assessments. And in the third stage of the planning process, this is where you're going to plan the service learning and classroom learning experiences that will ensure that your students have mastered the concepts outlined in stage one. I like to think of this stage as the lesson planning phase of the unit plan, as this is where you'll be looking at the day-to-day -day activities and practices both in the classroom and in the community. And the last stage of the process is the self-assessment. In this stage, anyone who was involved in the planning of the unit, which is stages one and stages two, will review the unit as a whole and assess the efficacy of the unit against the K-12 service learning content standards, as well as the academic and or civic education standards that were addressed in the unit. And you're gonna use this process really to identify any possible improvements or ways to engage in deepening the service learning experience either within or across the content areas. So in the interest of time for this webinar, we are really just going to focus more thoroughly on the first two stages of the investigation, which primarily focus on identifying desired results and determining your assessments. So if you're pulling up this webinar from the GSN or from nylc.org, the main resource that we will be using throughout the presentation today is the Academically Rigorous Service Learning Unit Plan and you can find that unit plan either in the GSN group or on our website at NYLC if you just search for that resource. So the main resource that we will be using throughout the webinar is the Academically Rigorous Service Learning Unit Plan, and there is a link coming through to that document right now on your screen, so if you don't have access to that already, you can certainly click on the link and collect it as needed. Before we jump into the planning uh, um, of our unit, the first thing that we want to do is to choose our topic. So when you're creating an interdisciplinary unit, I would recommend that you choose your topic from either the science or the social studies content areas, as these are two of the most easily integrated across the disciplines into ELA and mathematics as well. When you're choosing your topic, you want to remember that they should be broad and able to span multiple grades. So for example, you could choose a topic in a science strand like living systems or scientific inquiry or possibly even evolution. If you're looking in the social studies strand, you might choose something like economic reasoning or geospatial skills. 
So you want to just take a quick minute and pause the webinar and then think about any topic areas that you might want to include or explore throughout this webinar. You can use that as we kind of delve a little deeper into the template. So for the sample unit that we'll be following throughout the webinar today, the topic that I selected was economic reasoning. I chose this topic because it related directly to some current events that are going on in Minnesota, which is where NYLC is located. So while stage one of this process is often the most time consuming portion of the planning process, I also think that it's really one of the most fun for teachers. This is where teachers really get to display their craft and utilize their knowledge of student interests, their grade level standards, the community needs, and current events. So the idea for this sample unit came from a recent trip to northern Minnesota that I took with another one of my coworkers here from NYLC to lead a training for a group of students. For those of you who aren't familiar with Minnesota, uh, we have here what's known as the Iron Range, which runs through the northern part of the state. And the Iron Range and the resulting mining in that area has really had a significant impact on shaping the economy, cities, and the environment in Minnesota. But recently, we've had some new discoveries that have shown that there are significant quantities of nickel and copper that could have a drastic impact economically as well as environmentally on the region. So there's been a lot of buzz about what's going on and what will happen with this new mining and what it could possibly mean to the region, not only in terms of the economy, jobs, the environment, but really also this possibility that because of where the mines are located, it could generate a large sum of money for education, public education in, specific, in particular. So that may not initially sound like a great fourth grade topic, but thinking back to what fourth graders are really easily pulled into and what they can be interested in, I thought this topic would be really easy to create excitement around because it's exploring an issue for students who live in northern Minnesota that they most likely already have some background knowledge with. It could involve the environment, animals, pollution, which tend to be hot topics or areas of interest with that fourth, fifth grade market. And it also could really be a way to bring them into the economic side of it. So again, it's thinking about the audience and trying to pick a topic that's going to be easy to generate interest in and something that they will attach that meaningful service component to later in stage three. All right, so on our next slide here, in stage one of the unit plan, we're really focusing on framing the unit by identifying our desired results. In this stage, which is found on pages one through three of your unit plan, you're going to identify your standards, create your big ideas and essential questions, and outline what students will know, be able to do, and understand by the unit's end. So as you can see in the diagram above, I know that my topic's main focus is social studies but I also know that there will be English language arts standards that I can incorporate through the use of informational text and speaking and listening standards. And while initially I had planned on including math as a third discipline, I found that there was really a much more natural alignment to the Minnesota science standards, so I chose to focus there for this example. All right, so once we've identified the subject areas that we want to incorporate, we're going to do a little bit deeper of an exploration of the standards to ensure that we're creating an academically rigorous unit. In this slide, you can begin to see how we're going to drill down into each subject and draw out the strands, substrands, and standards that align with the topic. So for this particular unit, I've selected two strands from social studies, ELA, and science. As we move into the next slide, you can see that we've focused on the social studies content and drawn out a more defined view of the standards that students will be mastering. So while this slide highlights four standards, two from the economic strand and two from the geography stand strand, the entire unit would actually cover about 10 of the fourth grade Minnesota state standards for social studies, which means that you're talking about a half a year's worth or a semester's worth of content. And as you can see from this standard, for example, number three, which says because of scarcity, individuals, organizations, and governments must evaluate trade-offs, make choices, and incur opportunity costs, the information that students will need to gather to be able to address this standard can be tackled through the use of informational texts as well as through scientific exploration, which brings us to our next subject area and kind of really where you begin to see the interdisciplinary focus which is looking at English language arts. So this is the reason again that I mentioned in the beginning of the webinar that I typically like to start with science or social studies when I'm choosing a topic. 
By starting in one of these subject areas, you can really ensure that English language arts can be incorporated through the use of informational text and oftentimes even historical fiction. And the best part of this is that by integrating these units across the disciplines, you can maximize your instructional time and really make your formative and summative assessments that we'll discuss in stage two do double duty for you, which I know as a teacher favorite will minimize your grading time. So if we take a quick look at a couple of the standards, like number nine or number four, we can see that they say students will be able to report on a topic or text, tell a story, or recount an experience in an organized manner using an appropriate facts and relevant descriptive details to support main ideas or themes, speak clearly at an understandable pace. Those are all integral content and skill development areas that are going to allow our students to be successful and able to perform on, on an authentic summative assessment task. So it's really combining those two disciplines to make sure that students are synthesizing information and knowledge, and that's going to help them retain their larger concepts as well. All right, so we've looked at how the English language art standards integrate with our topic, and now it's time for us to explore science. This is really where I get excited about interdisciplinary units because it can show you what a high quality unit can do for your students. So the science standards that we're focusing on in this unit are really going to help us front load the content for the social studies standards. So by tackling the physical science and earth science standards, we're going to be able to build our students' background knowledge, which will facilitate their ability to make connections to the social studies content later in the unit. The standard that I was particularly interested in was number three in the earth and space science strand. And this standard says that rocks and earth materials may vary in composition, but when we drill down into the benchmark, students are asked specifically to recognize that rocks may be uniform or made up of a mixture of minerals and to describe and classify minerals based on their physical properties. And what that does is it really gives us a perfect knowledge base for discussing the copper and nickel mining that's gonna come up later in the service learning unit. Right, so here's another opportunity for you to just pause the webinar and really take a moment to challenge yourself in your planning process. Think about what are some other subjects that you could incorporate into the topics you brainstormed earlier, or how could math be incorporated into this unit? All right, so thinking back to what we've just gone over, I wanted to just give you an idea of what the template will look like after you've identified your academic and civic content standards. So what I have on the screen here is a screenshot of what this page looks like for this particular sample unit. And while you can't see all of the standards that have been highlighted, it should give you a pretty good idea of what this page is going to look like. This is an especially relevant page in your planner if you're a self-contained classroom teacher or even if you're working on this with a grade level pair across subjects. And you're going to really want to take the time during this phase to get all of those standards broken out and listed into the template. The amount of standards that you're covering obviously is going to vary based on the duration of your service learning project. The next step that we're going to approach in stage one involves incorporating all of our standards to create a big idea and the resulting enduring understandings. So in the template, the Big Ideas portion is broken out into academic and civic or character areas. As you can see here, we've selected one big idea for each in this example. Big ideas can often be tricky if you're just starting out in the backward design process, and quite frankly, even if you're an experienced practitioner. So to help you get started, there are a few things that you're going to want to remember. Big ideas are just that. They're big. But they have to go beyond that. They're not just large topics like number sense but they provide a way to organize information that helps the learner create a schema for how to connect and process that information. So we have two big ideas for this unit listed above. Our content-based big idea says that natural resources and economic factors influence geographic, cultural, and political change. And our civic or character big idea states that democratic government depends on informed and engaged citizens who exhibit civic skills and values, practice civic discourse, apply inquiry and analysis skills, and take action to solve problems and shape public policy. So as you can see, both of these big ideas are concepts and frameworks that could clearly span a student's knowledge across grade levels. 
So you're probably asking yourself at this point, how do you go about developing your big ideas? And this is where I like to rely on that old teacher standard of not reinventing the wheel. So make sure that you're using your resources. Be sure to go online. Most of the disciplines now have already selected their top 10 big ideas, and these are a great place to start. So Marcus is going to be sending through some links as well for this slide that will show the social studies standards, I'm sorry, social studies big ideas as well as the science big ideas. There's also going to be a link to an article from Grant Wiggins, which is on determining what a big idea is. So as you're developing your big ideas, like I said, you want to use those discipline-specific big ideas and tweak them accordingly to your grade level. You want to also look to your state standards and really use the standards here and not the benchmarks because the benchmarks will be a bit too specific to help you to frame your big ideas in a more relevant way to your grade level. You may also want to look at incorporating, incorporating several standards depending on the length of your unit. So it could be anywhere from a single standard or to create a big idea that combines multiple understandings across substrands or even strands. And then the last thing you're going to want to do is check your work against your objectives. So look back at those big ideas and determine if the idea spans multiple grade levels, does it help students organize and make sense of information, and is it a framework for synthesizing information. The next step in the planning process is to craft your essential questions. Remember, these questions will drive the inquiry throughout the unit, and they should be explicit and referenced often. It's often a good idea to refer back to the standards and the benchmarks you use to plan your unit to develop your essential questions. Some of the essential questions we've pulled for this unit are, to what extent should the effect of the environment play on the role of economic development for a geographic region? Who should control the development of a geographic region? And is there a right or wrong way to be an engaged citizen? So as you develop your essential questions, you want to make sure that they are able to cause genuine, relevant inquiry into the big ideas, that they provoke thought, discussion, and sustained inquiry to new understandings, and that they require students to think about and support their claims. And again, you also want to ensure that those essential questions are open-ended and that they are allowed to naturally recur throughout the unit, thus provoking deeper understanding from the students. Okay, we're going to take a quick pause here again for you to test your big idea skills. So thinking back to some of those ideas you had earlier in the webinar, in those brainstorm project topic areas, what are some big ideas or even essential questions that you could use for those topics? So if you just want to take a few minutes, pause the webinar here and quickly jot those down, that would be wonderful. All right, so we've gone through the first two steps in stage one, and we're in the final step now, which is where you're going to determine the knowledge, skills, and understandings that are essential to students mastering the standards and big ideas. In this portion of the planning template, you're going to refer back to the benchmarks for each of the standards you identified on page one. The benchmarks will most often highlight the understandings that your students must obtain, and from those understandings, you need to then draw out the knowledge and skills that students must demonstrate in order to develop those understandings. So for example, if I'm asking students to demonstrate an understanding of how the natural resources of an area have influenced how humans interact with that area through examining maps and historical documents, then they need to have a basic knowledge of that vocabulary and have also developed the ability to read and interpret maps and graphs of different types. This is also where you would utilize any pre-assessment data that you have to determine what prerequisite skills students will need to bring into this unit. And as you determine these prerequisite skills, you may also need to differentiate your content and process to ensure that students with varying readiness levels are able to achieve your performance objectives. All right, we've finally reached stage two. And stage two of the planning template, we are going to focus on our formative and summative assessments for the unit. As we're planning this portion of the unit, you really want to keep in mind all of that legwork that you just completed in stage one, because that's going to drive the content that you will use to assess your students in stage two. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, stage one is really time and labor intensive, but in stage two, you're already going to see some of the benefits of all that hard work. In stage two, you're going to essentially take all of the knowledge, skills, and understandings that were outlined in stage one and create ways to measure student mastery. 
This is where your alignment needs to be really tight, but essentially you're just going to go through those objectives that you listed earlier, put them into a chronological order, and then decide how you're going to assess them. So literally what the format is. Is it paper and pencil quizzes, oral reports, exit slip, whatever it might be. And then after you've decided those formative assessments, you're also going to want, to want to identify an authentic summative assessment task that can be differentiated for content and process so that when you move into stage three and your students are identifying their meaningful service opportunities, their area of interest can be fluidly integrated into your assessment. All right, so that was kind of a mouthful on differentiation and your summative assessments there. And you're probably asking yourself, what does this look like in reality? So you really want to keep in mind that with this backward design format, stage one and stage two are occurring before our students have been allowed to engage in investigation. So it's really important that our issue area is open and that we keep that summative assessment flexible so that we can make sure that our students are allowed to have meaningful service. This doesn't mean, however, that we are going to change any of the objectives of the assessment. It's really just grounding that service experience in the learning that needs to happen within the classroom. So if we look at this slide, if my authentic assessment task is that students will present an informed economic stance on copper and nickel mining in northern Minnesota, the nature of that assessment task really allows the content or the topic of that stance to be open to the meaningful service areas that my students will discover in their investigation step in stage three. So as I've outlined here, when we're investigating, my students could select impact on the environment or impact on jobs as their meaningful service area, and either way it would still align with my summative assessment. Also, their choice and topic won't change the standards that they'll need to meet to complete their summative assessment, such as supporting their stance through interpretation and analysis of data, including maps, describing the interaction of business and governments in the exchange of goods, or from the English language arts standards, the ability to effectively engage in discussion while clearly expressing their own viewpoints and ideas. The summative assessment task also allows for differentiation of process through the mode of communication. This is particularly beneficial because it allows students to select an assessment option that aligns with their service. In this case, many of the assessment options that would naturally fit with this task could also be used as advocacy in their service learning project. This allows for the integration of multiple learning modalities into your assessment format. So some of the ideas that we've highlighted here are that students could present a community lecture or a debate. They could write a letter to the editor in response to one of the articles that was written about mining in the area or they could create a public service announcement about the effects of mining on any of the issue areas that they've selected. Just to give you a quick snapshot of how the formative and summative assessments work together, I've pulled one objective from each subject area that students would need to master in order to successfully complete the summative assessment. In the case of a large unit such as this, there would actually be multiple standards for each subject area and multiple cycles of formative assessment, but this is really just to give you an idea of the process. So again, keeping the summative assessment task of presenting an informed economic stance in mind, students are going to have to have mastery of the English language arts skill of paraphrasing portions of a text or a media resource to support their argument. They're also going to need to be able to gather information from multiple types of maps to describe a region, and they will also need to have some basic understanding and knowledge of how to describe and classify minerals based on their composition. Again, I'm going to invite you to pause the webinar here and think back to the topics we discussed earlier, and based on those topics and the big ideas that you've created, what are some possible summative assessment tasks that you could use to measure student achievement? So even though we were focused on stages one and two during this webinar, I also wanted to give you an idea of what stage three of the template looks like. As I mentioned earlier, this is the stage where you're going to be doing your lesson planning. You're really looking at mapping out the daily classroom and community experiences that will make up the service learning unit. The basis of this section of the template is the IPARD cycle, which will be used to plan each segment of the unit. 
If you have any questions about this section of the template, please feel free to join our GSN group on interdisciplinary elementary units and post those questions to the forum there. It's a great resource to use. And I can also then respond and help you walk you through this section of the template if you need it. Now also, if you recall from the introduction, the last stage of this process is the self-assessment. And in the self-assessment, you're asked to evaluate the unit based on the K-12 service learning standards for quality practice, as well as the academic and civic standards of the unit. If you're interested in learning more about the standards, you can find information at lift.nylc.org. Also, as I mentioned in the last slide, you can join us on the GSN. If you're interested in continuing the discussion on how to create interdisciplinary units, or if you want to share plans with other teachers, or even just have a forum for questions about your service learning projects, feel free to join us on the Interdisciplinary Elementary Unit Group on the GSN. Marcus, again, is sending through a link along with this slide so that you can follow it and sign up. The group is free and open to the public. So feel free to pass it on to others that work in your schools or systems as well. And last but certainly not least, we have a page that covers some of the resources that we provide here at NYLC. We've mentioned a couple of them previously in the webinar, like the GSN or the Lift, but you can also find several paper resources on our website at www.nylc.org. So thank you for attending our webinar today. Again, my name is Whitney McKinley, and if you have any questions about content that occurred in this webinar, feel free to either contact me through the GSN group or at wmckinley at nylc.org. Thanks, and have a great day.